<laughs> this concept of being in union with Christ has been troubling me for months. I've been making notes of several places that have referred to this concept, but I wanted to stay in my lane, which is marriage and family, but I haven't been able to shake that off, shake off this thing about union with Christ. So yesterday, as my spirit continued to be bombarded by these words, even when um, Apostle was preaching, I finally decided to get into obedience with the Father and his Holy Spirit to humbly convey to you what we have as a result of being in union with Christ. And I believe as revelation knowledge um, of this can be truly grasped by us, nothing will be impossible to us and nothing will impede the advancement of this mighty army that we are raising up globally. Amen? Um, if you see me reading a lot in my notes, it's because I want to be able to get through with everything um, and not leave anything unsaid or undone. So uh, let us first examine what is meant by the term union. It is an act of fact of joining or being joined. It is a state of harmony or agreement. In mathematics, it is the set that comprises all the elements and no others contained in any two or more given sets. And I will come back to that before we end today with a, a, some diagrams that I have asked Tico to get ready. So it is also a marriage, and I've just got to get in this verse, which I would have loved to share on with you all if the Lord had permitted me, but you can read about it in my book. Where's Pastor Kenneth? In my book, <laughs> Marriage for the Better, you can read about this, okay? But it is said here um, in Ephesians 5, 31 to 32, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife or to be in union with his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So it is this aspect of being in union, of being one, of being um, um, becoming one to becoming one that I am sharing on the, the idea of Christ and his church. And let me just say this, throw in this, I can't forget this part. When God was looking for a relationship to exemplify Christ and his church, he did not choose the pastor and his congregation. He did not choose a parent and child. He did not choose brother and sister. He chose the marriage, the husband and the wife. Okay, so this lets us know that our marriages, it's not about us, it is about Christ and the church, that we exemplify what Christ and the church is like. So Christ does not abuse his church. The, 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 um, the church is supposed to be submissive to him in all things and so on. So that's just um, by the way, but that is not what I'm talking about this morning, okay? So what does the word say about this union? That is a great mystery, the Bible calls it, that of Christ and us because we are the church. Well, first of all, it is a recently revealed secret. When we say recently revealed, we're talking about actually 2,000 years ago, okay? It is a recently revealed secret, and here's the secret. It's found in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 6, and most of my, uh, most of my um, references will be from the, the um, TPT or the AMPC. So it says, here's the secret. This is in uh, Ephesians 3, 6 in the Passion. Here's the secret. The gospel of grace has made you, non-Jewish believers, into co-heirs of his promise through your union with him. And you have now become members of his body, one with the anointed one. And sometimes when I read things in the Passion, it's like, I never saw that before. I better go check the other versions to make sure that they are not <laughs> saying something that is not there. So I went to the Amplified, 
uh, um, and I read Amplified Classic, and, I, and, and this is how it says it in verses 5 to 6. This mystery was never disclosed to human beings in past generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles, consecrated messengers, and prophets by the Holy Spirit. It is this, that the Gentiles are now to be fellow heirs with the Jews, members of the same body, and joint partakers sharing in the same divine promise in Christ through their acceptance of the glad tidings of the gospel. So this thing about the, the church, you and I being in union with Christ, being married to Christ, if you want to use that term, being joined to Christ, is it has only been revealed since the church was born. And actually, I'll even go so further, I'll go further and say it is really to the Apostle Paul that most of this revelation was revealed. So we are, secondly, we are commanded to live in union with Christ. Uh, Ephesians 4, 22 to 24 in the Passion, it says, And he has taught you to let go of the lifestyle of the ancient man, the old self-life which was corrupted by sinful and deceitful desires that spring from delusions. Now it's time to be made new by every revelation that's been given to you and to be transformed as you embrace the glorious Christ within as your new life and live in union with him. For God has recreated you all over again in his perfect righteousness and you now belong to him in the realm of true holiness. I'm going to be reading a lot of the word because it is the word that brings about change. I can run about and be excited and so on. But I really want us to get this because for many people, this is a new and they, they, we have not really come into this understanding that we are in union with Christ. And whatever is in Christ is in us. Okay? So for those of us or those of you who may have been struggling with what the Bible calls the weight and sins that so easily besets us, because we have to understand that in this conference, we may have people at several different levels. And we're taking some, uh, you know, for some of them who've been here, we've been trying, we've been talking to them at, up here, and maybe it's not relevant to them. Uh, 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 so, so, so for those of you who may be struggling with things that beset you as he Hebrews 12, 1 to 2 says, Paul says it's time to be made new by every revelation. Your transformation will occur as you embrace this truth of Christ within you. Christ is not outside of you. He is in you. That's what the word says. And if, the, if it's in the word, it's in us. It's, it's, we, we have to believe it. It says that you have been recreated all over again and in his perfect righteousness. So when the old man and those old habits try to creep in to drag you in a direction that you know is wrong, we have to open our mouth. We, uh, Pastor said, don't run at your giant with your mouth closed. And so you say, no, I'm not a smoker. Yeah. No, I'm not a fornicator. I'm not an alcoholic. I know they tell you um, when you go to these Alcoholic Anonymous, you have to keep saying, I am an alcoholic. Well, if you are an alcoholic, you will, you will always drink. That's what they tell them to say. That's in the 10 whatever things that they say. You have to keep saying, I am an alcoholic. But no, we have to say, I am not an alcoholic. You know, I'm not a profane person. I have been recreated all over again in his perfect righteousness. I am in union with Christ. I am one with him. This is how you beat those sins, those thoughts, those things that keep coming to you and you feel you have to fall into it over and over again. You know, I, I, somebody said, um, I, I may have shared this some time ago, but um, I was reading in this book and it was not a Christian book. It was just a motivational book for people in business and stuff like that. And the guy said, this is the difference between two people who are trying to quit. Let's say smoking. So he says, the first person is offered a cigarette and he says, no, I'm trying to stop smoking. 
I'm trying to stop smoking. Um, the second person is offered a cigarette and he says, no, thank you, I'm not a smoker. So he sees himself in this new identity of not being a smoker. The other one is still seeing himself as a smoker trying to quit. Who will have the victory? The other one. Amen? So when these thoughts, when these sinful uh, maybe habits or, or um, actions are trying to get you there, and for some of us, we may have been saved a long time, but there's always something that is besetting. There's always an area where we're struggling with. We open our mouth and we say, I am not that person. I am in union with Christ. Christ is in me. Amen? So uh, Jesus said... Um, in John 15, 1 to 5, he says, I am a true sprouting vine, and the farmer who tends the vine is my father. He cares for the branches con um, connected to me by lifting and propping up the fruitless branches and pruning every fruitful branch to yield a greater harvest. When I was reading this last night, this just brought joy to my heart because usually when it's a, he, he, he prunes it and you, you think of something that is just so harsh, you know, uh, the, the, <laughs> the owner of the vineyard is coming and because he doesn't see any fruit, he's just, you know, doing some harsh stuff. But it, it, the, the Amplified says, uh, the father cares for the branches. We are those branches. He cares for the branches. So he lifts them up. He props up the fruitless branches. Those of you who do gardening can um, identify with this. That doesn't mean that I do it because um, plants and I do not agree very well. Um, like my son, he got that from me. But he says he props it up. Um, props up the fruitless branches and pruning every fruitful branch to yield a greater harvest. He, then he says, the words I have spoken over you have already cleansed you. So you must remain in life union with me. For I remain in life union with you. For as a branch severed from the vine will not bear fruit, so your life will be fruitless unless you live your life intimately joined to mine. So if you're looking for fruit in your life, if you're saying, but, you know, I don't see any fruit. This is, this is what Jesus said. He says, without, apart from me, or if you're severed from me, you can't bring forth any fruit. He says, but your life will, uh, uh, when your life is intimately joined to mine, he says, you will um, be fruitful. I am the sprouting vine and you're my branches. As you live in union with me as your source, fruitfulness will stream within you. But when you are separated from me, you are powerless. Please hear this. Whatever is in the vine is in the branches. Stop frustrating yourself trying to be fruitful because you may bring out some fruit, but it will be forced ripe. Those from the Caribbean would ex understand this expression when they say, you know, you get a mango, and the mango looks so nice. And you bite into it, and it's the worst thing. And we say, it forced ripe. We didn't say it was forced ripe. You know, we say it forced ripe. You know, so, so, so sometimes, because we, we saw uh, under this, this um, how should I say it, under this pressure or stress, we want to do things for God. We want to be fruitful. We want to be this kind of way. And we're thinking that somehow I, as this branch, has to produce this fruit. And so we produce and we're forcing out this fruit, but the fruit is not ready. The fruit is not for that time. And so it is forced ripe. Yeah. Because we do not understand that our source, the source of the fruitfulness, is in the vine. And so sometimes you just have to be patient with yourself. Keep acknowledging, well, Jesus, I am in you. You are in me. And so you will produce that fruit in my life. 
in due season because there are different seasons for different time um, fruit. You know, everything doesn't come out. And sometimes it's only, we've been trying to, um, we, we have a mango tree, two, three mango trees in our backyard now. And um, only one came out, you know, and my husband as the priest of the home, of course, it belonged to him. But he did share, he did share, he did share a piece with me, a piece with his sister, and a piece with Melody, and still ending up with most of it. <laughs> He's a priest. <laughs> he did, Lynette, you were not even thought of at that time. You were not even in the picture. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I know. It's a rare mango. I'm telling you that. But it's also the same with many mangoes, okay? Just telling you that. Rare or not rare. Don't mess with his mangoes. <laughs> so, um, so, so, so nothing tastes as bad as a forced ripe mango or fruit, any kind of fruit. So, so, so what do we do? No, we just concentrate on living in union with Christ, the source, and you will not be able to help being fruitful. Even if you tried, if you're living in union with Christ, you will be fruitful. It's like, it's like what my husband said, you want to say no to somebody. You know, because you're looking at all the expenses, we have all of this and that, and you want to be able to say no to them. But because Christ is your source, you know, and that fruitfulness is, is going to uh, go through you, even if you like it or not, you find yourself many times saying yes to somebody when you really wanted to say no. Because you are intimately joined to the vine. So what are the benefits of this union? We've looked at, uh, just reminding you, we, we have looked at the fact that it's a recently revealed secret. We've looked at the fact that it is a command to live in union with Christ. But what are the benefits? What are the benefits of this union? First of all, it is so that we will fulfill our destiny. Ephesians 2.10 says, we have become his poetry, a recreated people that will fulfill the destiny he has given each of us, for we are joined to Jesus, the anointed one. Even before we were born, God planned in advance our destiny and the good works we would do to fulfill it. So it, 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 when, when we are joined to Jesus, when we are in union with him, we will fulfill the destiny that he gave us even before. And when I saw that verse, that was another verse some uh, months ago. I had to check it out somewhere else too. I said, well, I don't know, I mean this, we have become his poetry. Or Where's that? I don't, never saw that. Yeah, in the Amplified it says, for we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand for us, taking paths, and I love this, it says, taking paths which he prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. Folks, I don't know why anybody would not want to serve God. If God has all, God's, God's plan is that we live the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. So when you get up in the morning, when I get up in the morning, uh, I, I, I'm looking at the day and one of my confessions is, uh, you know, Lord, you've gone ahead into this day. You know, God, I'm going to walk into the things that you have planned for me today before the universe was even founded. Because I'm telling you, there's a distractor. There is a, an energy enemy that wants to get you out of that book, out of the book, out of what is written in the book and into a different book. So you, when you get up in the mornings, you have to be consciously asking God and looking for, okay, what has been prearranged for me today? How does God want me to walk? What he, does he want me to walk in today? Did he want you to walk into an explosion with your husband? I don't think that's in the book. 
Did he want you to, to, to walk into a, a hole um, where, where you've been disrespectful to your employer and you're not really representing, as they say, you're not representing Jesus? I don't think that was in the book. I don't think God prearranged that. So if we are doing things like it's because we are stepping out of the book to write our own story. You know, the, the whole computer thing, it teaches us, some, there is a, what do you call it now? Um, there's a program, okay? I, the, all the IT people here, will, there's a program. But sometimes somebody could insert what they call a virus into that program. So that program does not, is not effective. That program does not do what it was meant to do. It's doing something else. And so we have to be very conscious of this. Every day we get a, this, is, this should be our, 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 our um, what we focus on. A first thing in the morning, okay, Lord, here I am. I, I, I'm ready. Show me what is written out for me today. Okay? So, so, so this is, of course, um, so that we will fulfill our destiny. Another benefit of being in union with Jesus is that we have become God's inheritance. Yes. What happens when you receive an inheritance? You treasure it. Right. You protect it. Yes. You guard it. You guard it well. And this is why Ephesians 3, 6 says that God has claimed us as his own inheritance through our union with Christ. If God has claimed us as his own inheritance, don't you think that God is going to look out for you better than you even look out for your own inheritance? Don't you think that God is going to fight for you when somebody, like how you fight when somebody is trying to take your inheritance from you? Don't you think that God is going to guard you and keep you? We are his inheritance. And, and he claimed us as his inheritance. No Nobody gave, him to, gave us to him. He claimed us as his inheritance. And so we, and it is through our union with Christ. That is why we need to stay in union with Christ. One, another reason why we have to, uh, why we, we a, a benefit of um, this being in union with Christ is that God's love has been perfected in, in us. In the Amplified in 1 John 4, 17, it says, In this union and communion with him, love is brought to completion and attains perfection with us, that we may have confidence for the day of judgment with assurance and boldness to face him. Because as he is, so are we in this world. As he is, so are we in this world. In this union, our communion with him, love is brought to completion. And what are, what are the byproducts of this perfected love? The, it's boldness and it's deliverance from fear and the ability to love others. Uh, it, it says it this way in the Passion. Uh, by living in God or being in union, Love has been brought to its full expression in us so we may fearlessly face the day of judgment. And if we could fearlessly face the day of judgment, we can certainly fearlessly fa face flying. Yeah. We can certainly fearlessly face roaches. We can certainly fearlessly face rats. We can certainly fearlessly face driving on the highway and not having to have our husbands drive us everywhere we want to go. I'm just saying, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sending this to anybody, okay? I'm just, I'm just saying. Because I think the day of judgment is a scarier thing. And that's an understatement. But if he says, by living in, uh, in God, love has been brought to its full expression in us so that we may fearlessly face the day of judgment. Because all that Jesus, 
all that Jesus now is, so are we in this world. Love never brings fear. For, for, for fear is always related to punishment. But love's perfection drives the fear of punishment from our hearts, far from our hearts. Whoever walks constantly afraid of punishment has not reached love's perfection. Our love for others is our grateful response to the love God first demonstrated to us. So it is saying here, whether we believe it or not, that when we are fearful, it is because our concept, the way we think about God is not the way he is. And that is because most of us have been raised with parents telling us, God will punish you. I don't know about you, but these are, you know, in our generation, is God will punish you. Or if it happens, you see, you're punished for that. God is punishing you for that. I, I, eh? I don't like, or, or in America, they say, God don't like ugly. Okay. So, so we have this concept that God is a God that is just up there ready to punish us. And so we have fear. Because if you, when there is fear or when you are not convinced of how much God loves you, fear takes over. And I was so glad for the series that uh, my son shared on um, love. Make room for love. And especially the concept that it is not so much that we love God, but that God loves us. Because I will tell you the truth, people. There have been times that I've been struggling with, I don't know if I love God that much. I don't know if, you know, sometimes you see other people and the things they're doing and my husband crying over things. And, and I feel, and he asked me, you love God? <laughs> <laughs> Honey, you love God? <laughs> And sometimes I will feel as if, well, I don't know if I, I'm not feeling that. I'm not feeling that emotional stuff, you know, so maybe I do. And so when I get on a flight now and uh, that airplane starts to shake like crazy and he is sleeping <laughs> and I am praying in tongues and, uh, you know, I'm making declarations and confessions. Over me is the blood of the Lamb. Underneath me, uh, the, uh, 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 the Lord goes before me. Uh, uh, the angel of the Lord, uh, the angels of the Lord are in camera. And I'm, I'm, I'm all in a panic. And I'm telling, let me tell you something. If you have never, ex you see people who don't experience that, they cannot understand the kind of torment. Because that's what the word says. Fear has torment. And you can't understand the torment. I, I, I used to be so tormented. I would be cold. I know the airplane is cold, but it's not that cold. I'm shivering with cold. And, um, and, uh, and, and he's sleeping. <laughs> How can you lie asleep, master? <laughs> Don't you see that we are about to be destroyed? The winds and the waves. <laughs> How can you sleep at a time? Care us now, not that we perish. <laughs> oh my gosh, but it used to be a real torment. And years before, I remember when I was working on my master's and, and we talked about some of these things and there was a, a guy in the class um, who said to me, oh, the reason you are afraid of flying is because you don't trust God. I was so annoyed with him. How can you tell? I've been saved since I was eight years old. How can you try? How dare you tell me that I don't trust God? But that didn't help me because I still used to be in such torment that every time I fly, I said, I, I said God, if you see I'm going to be doing this thing, this has to change. You know, and, and I would tell myself, I'm not doing this again. But as this word of um, perfect love drives out all fear, I can testify. And I'm going to testify because some of you say, don't say anything. The devil might hear you and the next time it will be so. But I testify that for the last uh, two or three flights, and they were long distances, people. All 13 hours and someone you're watching the time, and it is only two hours? 
You still have 11 hours to go. And this thing is not going down on the earth even to give you a break. But I can truly say that even when it shook, I did not feel that fear inside. You know, and a few times he, he would wake up out of his sleep and he would touch my hands. I'm glad he did, but I didn't really need it. I mean, really, usually I would be the one grabbing for him, honey. <laughs> but this thing about perfect love, mature love, when you really understand that God really loves you. I mean, if he wants to kill you, he could kill you right here on the earth. <laughs> he don't have to send you up in a plane and kill 400 other people to get to you, you know. So, huh? Somebody should write a book on that. I annoy and point you to write it, Pastor. Get it? <laughs> but, but truly, um, it is fear of punishment. So we need to re-examine our concept. What do we really believe about God? And that is going to help rearrange, renew our mind, and cause us to, to have the victory that God has already provided for us. And this goes for any area where you may have. For some people, it's been in an elevator. And for the rest of us, what is wrong with that? You know, why are you f afraid of that? You know, but, but everybody has certain areas. Some people f afraid of the dark. Frogs, are they online listening? The frog person? <laughs> okay, still talking about the benefits of this union. It says, and this is, and this is for you who have been experiencing burnout in ministry. You feel as if you don't have the passion anymore. And the thing is you are ashamed or afraid to admit it to yourself and more so to others. And this is going to help you. I'm going to help you, yes. according to Medea. I'm going to help you. <laughs> Romans 15, verse 17 in the Passion. It says, now then, it is through my union with Jesus Christ that I enjoy an enthusiasm and confidence in my ministry for God. So when you find yourself feeling as if, oh my gosh, I I just don't have it in me anymore. I just, I just don't feel like doing this anymore. Or, you know, and, 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 and you're expected to come up with a message of encouragement. You're expected to, to minister to this, to this person. People want you to counsel with them when your own marriage may be under fire. Yeah. Yeah. But the word says, it is not. It's not in us. It's not, just, uh, it's not just because of us. It says, it is through my union with Jesus Christ that I enjoy an enthusiasm and confidence in my ministry for God. So it doesn't matter what you may be happening on the outside, as long as you can say, I am in union with Christ, that enthusiasm, that confidence is a benefit of being in union with Christ. And let me just say this, we can have benefits and never use them. You know, some of us have so many benefits, even with our medical insurance for those of us who have it, and, and, and you never use it. You have dental insurance and you don't go get your teeth cleaned. It's free for heaven's sake. Every six months you can go do that. But it's a benefit that you're just not using. You know? Um, so, so, so the benefit is there. That enthusiasm and confidence. Finally, and this is going to free many of us, what is the nature of this union? First of all, it is by faith. Colossians 2 and 6 in the Passion. In the same way you receive Jesus, our Lord and Messiah, by faith. Continue your journey of faith, progressing further into your union with him. 
So it's, what is this sin? It is saying the same way we got saved. How did we get saved? It was by faith. It was by faith that we say we are saved. It is by faith that we get healed. It is by faith we get prosperity. Everything, nothing comes to us without faith. Because if it is of works, then we would get all the glory and God would have none. So he says, it is by faith. Continue your journey of faith, progressing further into your union with him. The second thing that comes out in that verse, it is progressive. So he says, continue your journey, progressing further into your union with him. Uh, let, let's get back, uh, if, if Tico can help me here, let's get back to um, that math definition of union where it says that, you know, it is like two sets. So this would be like, this one over here and over there, that's when you are not in union with Christ. That's before you were even saved, okay? You are two separate uh, entities. Then as you get into Christ, you may come up to, let, let's see the second one. So you are in union with him, uh, but is that shadowed area? That's as much as you are allowing uh, that union with Christ to benefit you. Every, whatever is in Christ is in you in that little part there. But as you progress further, it might look something like this, where most of it, you are, you are in such union with Christ through faith. You are progressing further. Your faith is increasing. As you hear the word, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So you yield more and more of yourself to this union. You yield up those fears. You yield up your doubts. You yield up some of those bad ways that you had where you say, I have to give them a piece of my mind and stuff like that. As, as you yield more and more to Christ, you are coming more and more into union with him. So everything thing that is in him is now in you. Most of what is in him is in you. But our goal is to come like this, where you are so completely in union with Christ. As you progress further and further by faith, where all that is in Christ is in us, we, be, we understand what it is to be one. My final point, though, it is contingent on your level of hunger. And that's what so many of the other speakers have said. Uh, Colossians 3, 1 to 4, I heard Pastor Lynette refer to this today, and I think my husband did it some time ago. Christ's resurrection is your resurrection, too. That is why we are to yearn for all that is above, for that's where Christ sits enthroned, at the place of all power, honor, and authority. So if what is in him, that power, that honor, that authority, we are to yearn for it. Yes, feast on all the treasures of the heavenly realm and fill your thoughts with heavenly realities and not with the distractions of the natural realm. Your crucifixion with Christ has severed the tie to this life and now your true life is hidden away in God, in Christ. And as Christ himself is seen for who he really is, who you really are will also be revealed, for you are now one with him in glory. I can't say it any better than the word says it. I can't say it any better than that. So we are to yearn for that. We are to hunger for that. We, the, we, we are to immerse ourselves in the word so that we understand, we come to that revelation knowledge, I am in union with Christ. When I'm walking around, Christ is walking around in me. I mean, it sounds, for some people, if we had said that, and that's why it's a, a, a secret that has only been revealed recently, because if you had preached this some years ago, uh, they would have been stoned. You would have been stoned because we had so much self um, 
sin con consciousness and self-righteousness that we could not understand or grasp this. And that's why we live such defeated lives. And that's why the church has not accomplished all that it's supposed to accomplish. And we are still waiting for the revelation of the true sons and daughters of God. God bless you.